So we are on week three of Prepare the Way, and this week we're going to be talking about preparing our homes. So now I want to remind you that last week we talked about in Second Chronicles how there was a group of people that found themselves in a position where it was necessary to restore the temple of God that was lying in ruins, and they had to restore it to the original design and then strengthen it. And so we kind of we put the thought out there last week that here we are now, post-COVID, looking at a church, really examining what things do we want to go back to normal and what things actually we need to go back to the original design. Come on. And that if we're going to prepare the bride for what's coming globally with the promised persecution that I see in Revelation, that you would see in Revelation in the book of Daniel, that we see that there will be one day when this temple that we meet in here, we will not be allowed to meet here anymore. So what will happen? I told you about how Pastor Jeremy um, gave the question. He said, I had the thought, what would happen if one day we're not allowed to live stream? We're not allowed to meet in this temple. And so we sort of left last week with this idea and this, this notion that, guys, we have to prepare the bride for what is coming. And this is a promised persecution that is coming. Now, I'm not an eschatologist, so I don't know whether this would happen in our lifetime, our kids' lifetime, or later, but I can tell you it's coming, and it's certain that it's coming. And I think that the way that we have approached Christianity for hundreds of years is going to take a little bit to turn the ship back to God's design. So we might as well start right now. And I believe that COVID afforded us the opportunity to hear the alarm sounding and let us not hit snooze, right? Let us us restore the temple to its original design and let us strengthen it because only in a restoration to God's design... Can we truly be prepared for the second coming of Christ? What we're essentially talking about, and not to make people fearful, that's not the point of this, but if we know this is coming, then we need to prepare a bride that can function when the church is shut down. What we're talking about is an underground network of Christians like they had in the New Testament. That when the temple was broken and shattered, the Christians were strong enough to make it underground and they were connected enough with the believers and the apostles that even underground they could pass letters from the apostles like sermons. They could pass, they had the Torah, they would gather around and they functioned and actually thrived more underground than above ground. And actually there was more strength, more maturity because it was God's original design. So I'm going to show you a picture of what, just as a recap of what we talked about last week and how this here on Sundays, a lot of times we just think of church as this building. We just think of church as really a bunch of talented people who come up here and you put your best and your brightest up here and you get a, a couple of good singers and somebody who can preach really well and you gather a big crowd and we go to, the, we go to church like we go to the movies and then we leave. And this is so far from what God intended church to be and everyone said amen and so the temple's real true purpose and the levites which is just an old testament kind of name for people who feel called to ministry pastors evangelists teachers missionaries um, the levites our job according to ephesians is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry that the levites the small group that are called to live from the gospel and let me tell you their job is not more important than your job You are the majority. If you do not, if you work out in the world, God doesn't want you to quit your job unless you're called to it because some of you, you are called to be a teacher. You are called to be a police officer. You are called to be a doctor. Do you hear me? And it's not more spiritual what we do than what you do. As a matter of fact, our job is to equip you, encourage you, correct you, strengthen you. For you to come into this temple while we have the right and the ability to, and for us to teach you the word of God and how to study, to equip you, to heal you. You'll come in bleeding and, and broken and to bind up your wounds. Do you hear me? So this is the job of the temple. Not that we would come in the temple and we would go watch them make disciples, Come on, somebody. Not that we would come into the temple and go pay them to make disciples for you, but you're coming into the temple to be equipped to now go make disciples for yourself. 
And so this is where homes come into play. And so here's the temple, but in Acts, they met in the temple and they met in homes. And this week, we're really going to focus on what this actually practically looks like and what your job is. We talked a lot last week about what my job is and our job is, but what is your responsibility and your calling as it looks in your home. And so the home is a place where you break bread, you have food, and you eat and you laugh and you share things together with a group of people. And then from there, you reach your sphere, your world, your school, your workplace. And this is where your unique gift set comes into play. God has given you unique spiritual gifts. He's given you a unique calling in your sphere. And when you show up to your workplace, suddenly light has broken the darkness. Suddenly, Jesus, the spirit of Jesus alive inside of you, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, has now just shown up at Mapscott Elementary or wherever. Do you hear me? This is how we win the world is we invade the world. But it takes all of us. This is a body of believers. So what is your calling? If we talked about your calling, what is your calling? It'll be the same as my calling. We are all called to be discipled and to make disciples. Every one of us have a personal mandate from the Lord to be discipled and to make disciples. Now, how do we make disciples before I go into that. I know all of, some of you are already sweating. You think I'm going to call you up here to preach. You think I'm going to call you up here to pray. And I've watched as we're in a home. And some of you, like when it's time to pray for the food, and like you're like touching your nose. Nobody wants to be the one. You know, that game where you touch your nose and the person, last person, you have to pray. Ha ha. You know, like some of you, you don't even want to pray in public, okay? So I want you to know that you can breathe. So everybody right now, just take a big breath. Because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And God's design is not burdensome. As a matter of fact, the scripture says that those who love him keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. And I'm going to show you how God's design is actually a breath of fresh air, that it's actually natural and organic, and we're going to return to what's natural and organic, because we are an organism, not an organization. Do you hear me? This is a living, breathing, moving organism, and it's natural and organic. And so to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord, we have to prepare the bride. We have to prepare our hearts, but we also have to prepare that middle part. We have to prepare our homes. And so preparing our homes really first involves inviting Jesus into our home, giving Christ access to the home. In Revelation, it says, look, I stand at the door and knock. This is Jesus. If you hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and we'll share a meal together as friends. Now, every time I've ever heard this verse, I've heard it in the context of someone who was lost and God just wants to come into your heart. Jesus is standing at the door of your heart. Just open it and let him in. And we could definitely use it in that context as a secondary application. But actually, Jesus was talking to a church in Revelation when he said this. What church has left Jesus out in the cold knocking on the door, asking if he can come in and share a meal with them. Do you see the irony in this? And I believe it's not just our churches we've left him outside. We've left him outside of our homes because we've only seen the church as this building and not that our home should be an extension of this sanctuary. Come on. Your home should not be a place that you struggle, that you're tempted. Your home should be a safe haven and a place of peace. Come on, somebody. And Jesus has to be invited in for that to happen. You have to give him access. And the scriptures actually talk a whole lot about the concept of hospitality. It's actually, I think, sort of a lost um, concept in our culture that it's waxing and waning. We don't invite people over. We don't have a hospitable heart. Even in the Deep South, I've watched it sort of as we've gone more virtual, as the square footage has gone up, we've actually become more isolated. We're even isolated in our own homes. Our square footage goes up. Our house gets bigger. It's now even our own family, among our family, we all retreat to our own space. Do you hear me? And we're more isolated as a culture than ever in the history of humanity. But in Romans chapter 12, verse 13, it says, When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. In 1 Peter 4, 9, it says, show hospitality to one another without complaining. I love that. And I think of Martha. Like, she invited Jesus in. She let him in. And she's throwing this lavish party. But, boy, she complains the whole time about it. Anybody humble enough 
to admit that you've maybe opened your home and you complained about it the whole time, right? Like in your heart, maybe not in your mouth. Okay, I guess, I guess me and a few of the ladies are, are the only ones that go through this. But it says hospitality without complaining, that we should be eager to practice hospitality. In Hebrews chapter 13, it says, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. This is beautiful. For some who have done this have entertained angels without even realizing it. Now, we can take this literally as angels, but also this word angel means messenger of God. And so this could be that they're entertaining people that are working on behalf of God without realizing it. And now if you think about technology, that when we can take um, a message that God has given someone and we can stream it on our television or turn on a TV for a curricula, that we can literally entertain the message of God without even realizing it and opening our home for other people to experience this. Jesus told the disciples, when you travel from place to place. If the person lets you in the home with the gospel, pray a blessing over their house. Do you hear me? Jesus want access, wants access to our homes, but we have to open the door and give him access to it. So we're going to look at five things that biblical home discipleship is. It should be that if we study scripture, if we're going to look at it according to God's design, then we need, and we need, we should, then what does that look like? The first thing that biblical home discipleship is, is it's supernatural. And what I mean by that is it's very natural. It's organic. It's relational. I want you to think about the Acts 2 church. I would just surmise that if I was growing up in 70 AD and I was a part of the Acts church or 40 AD as a part of the Acts church, that there was no website to go and click on um, to find a group according to the things that I like. Hmm, this is a Pinterest Bible study. This is a judgmental Facebook page. Christian. Um, you see what I'm saying? It was organic. People lived their life, and people they naturally did life with, they said, hey, come over. We're going to study the word and pray together. Do you hear me? It was natural. It was no stress. And so what we've created by trying to organize too much and control too much in home groups is a very unnatural version of life group. When we, and some of that's necessary because you have people that are out of town that don't know anybody, new believers that need a place to go, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But for the most part, these groups should look very authentic, very organic, very relational, that you just invite people into your sphere that are already there. You know those people that you don't even have to clean up your house when they come over. Like Pastor Aaron and Pastor Tab. We went up to their house. We surprised them a couple weeks ago, and it was a disaster, and I loved it, right? <laughs> but you know you're close when you let your friends come over when your house is a mess, right? And so there's an element, actually, and every time I'm going under somebody's house and there, it's a mess, I'm like, yes. You know, like anybody else, like you feel like, yes, I'm not the only one whose house gets messy sometimes. And so this is organic. Think, think Mary, don't think Martha, Martha missed the point. Jesus is in her living room, and she's worried about hors d'oeuvres, right? And so this is organic and relational. Everybody just brings something. You're not overworking. This should not be stressed. You just invite them home, them in. Remember in Acts 2, it said there was a deep sense of awe, verse 43. It says all the believers were doing this, and a deep sense of awe, and they met in one place, and I'm going to skip down. It says they were enjoying and praising God, enjoying the goodwill of the people. You get this sense in Acts that there was this life, and there was this fun, and listen, it's even very careful to tell us there was food, right? They broke bread. And this is why I love the idea of potlucks rather than one person bringing something. Everybody just bring it whatever they feel like. Cooking, come on, don't plan it too much. That's how you get to know their best dishes, right? And you get ideas. Everybody just bring in what they feel like and contributing and you get to, and it's no stress on one person. It's just life-giving. Come on. You see how this is a breath of fresh air? Not over-organized, not over-planned, just organic. Don't make it too churchy either. Don't come in and then everyone's in choir robes. Um, sing to the Lord. Okay, don't make it too churchy. So this is just natural. But you want to know what's not natural? Virtual is not natural. Virtual is a temporary solution when it's absolutely absolutely necessary. 
but virtual is not natural. So if you're just watching alone, please hear me. Find some way to connect in person, even if it's one other person. I love that promise from Jesus that says where two or three are gathered. That means even if it's one other person who's also social distancing, that you're getting together in your home, breaking bread, laughing together. Make it supernatural. The second thing home discipleship is, biblical home discipleship, is intentionally spiritual. Now, when I say supernatural, what I don't want you to think of, this is just that God's not a part of it. This is not another Jamberry Nails party, right? Like this is like intentionally spiritual for the purpose of growing the kingdom. And this is a place where we make prayer and worship outside of the church normal again. Now, I, when we were talking about doing our life group for my kids' friends, and so we don't post them. We're just organically. Who do they hang out with? Who do they want to come over? We're just going to let them come to our house, and we're going to start going through a curricula that the church has purchased. And so we just have them over. And so as a church, when you invite someone to your home, guess what? We as Levites have already studied, watched things, prayed over it, and purchased materials. And we give you a list of things that we say, hey, these are great resources. We'll give you access to them for free. We'll supply you. We'll coach you. We'll give you advice about that cookie person that came last week and what to do. Do you hear me? We're equipping you and you can have church organically, but it needs to be spiritual. But when I was talking to my daughters about having them over, they said, we're going to sing. That's weird. We're going to sing in our house. That's weird. Now, I am a Cajun mountain mama, which means I'm originally from Baton Rouge, but I transplanted here. I'm here for life. Okay, Brent, something happens to Brandon. I'm in my mountains. I love my mountains forever, right? Um, However, so Cajun culture actually is very eclectic and very different. It's a group of Acadians that a long time ago migrated to southern Louisiana, and so they all spoke French. And now they speak, this group of people speaks Cajun French, and it's like a mixture of, like, French and country and swamp. I don't know how to explain it, okay? It's very unique, and there's a lot of words no one understands that speaks French at all. They don't understand these people, okay? And so, however, what's happened, I remember we used to do field trips when I was little to these little Acadiana villages. They would tell us about, we went to an old schoolhouse, and they would tell us how when the Canadian Canadians first migrated, they all spoke French, but it was seen as a lesser language than English, and so they would take the paddle and they would spank kids if they heard them speaking in French. And they were not allowed to speak French at all, even in their homes, because they wanted them to be more superior and to only speak English. And so what's happened residually from this is now the Cajun French language is almost completely gone from Louisiana. There's a very select few that even still speak it. And see, I I see this as sort of a parallel of what's happened in Christianity. Because the most normal expression, the most original expression of Christianity is praying with someone in your home, is breaking bread and studying scripture. And somehow now it feels weird to us And it's a foreign language to us. And we need to break through and push through the awkwardness and re-normalize that our faith was built on believers gathering in their home and praying for each other. That we have to know how to pray for one another again. And listen, it's just like any other foreign language. At first, when you say that word or you're learning it, you're going to feel like an idiot or that you're doing it wrong. But the more you practice, the more you just begin to exercise, praying for people, encouraging somebody, it's going to start coming naturally to you. But we have to re-normalize prayer in our homes. And so I want to read you these a couple of scriptures. James chapter 5, verse 16. It says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. We are to pray for one another. In Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, therefore encourage one another, build one another up just as you are doing. So they would sing hymns, they would pray, they would encourage one another in our homes. We have to renormalize prayer and worship and Bible study in the home. And can I just challenge you, when someone says, hey, would you pray for me? I have dot, dot, dot. Don't just say yes and then walk out and forget it. You know how you don't forget it? You stop what you're doing right there and you pray for them right there. And it doesn't matter if you sound like a toddler Christian praying. Do it. Do it. I'm going to tell you, I don't care what words come out of your mouth. You stop in that moment when somebody just asked you to pray for them and you pray for them and they're going to be crying. It's going to minister to them because somebody took time to stop and pray for them. And so it has to be intentionally spiritual. The next part I'm super passionate about is it has to be multi-generational. We have to deliberately build 
on our apostles' foundation. Now, in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul talks about how he's a master builder. And you can go back and look this scripture up if you want in verse 3, starting in verse 9. And he says that he was careful to lay the foundation of Christianity with precious stones. And he says we have to be careful how we build upon this foundation. And so, you know, when David died, there was an interesting scripture. It said that David died after he had done the will of God in his own generation. Stop just a moment and think about that. After he had done the will of God in his own generation. Now, for a moment, I want you to just imagine what it's like to watch Jesus resurrect from the dead, to receive the commission to now start a new faith globally. And that every single one of these Christians had to endure persecution most to the point of death. I want you to think about the fact that Christianity, now I'm a patriot, I told you this last week, and I believe we should totally honor our vets that a sacrifice that they paid for us to have freedoms that we have in this nation. But how much more should we honor and build upon for the next generation and teach the next generation to value Christianity when Christ himself was killed for it. When if you think about the kingdom of God being a seed planted in the ground, it was not water that watered it, but the blood of the martyrs of our early Christian faith. That is what it cost us to be able to sit in this room and to carry on Christianity. They built this thing with precious stones. How are we carrying the baton? How is our generation carrying the baton that was passed to us? What will happen to Christianity by the next generation unless someone in here, someone listening, or maybe a group of us decide that it's our responsibility. The scripture says we will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation. That's a collective we. We will tell. You know, Paul tells Timothy, you have many teachers but not many fathers. And I would say we have many babysitters, but not many mothers and fathers in the faith. Now, I w- went to Hawaii a few years ago. Don't be mad at me and don't, be, don't hate me, okay? But I did. And there's a tree there, and I want to show you this tree. It's called a banyan tree. Now, um, this tree has an aerial root system. It's basically when the roots actually come from down from the branches, and they form new trunks. And so go ahead and go to the next picture. Really fascinating. It's a massive tree. Go to the next one. Now, this is the entire tree, okay? It's one acre. This is one tree. And so each new aerial root system connects to the ground and makes the tree larger. This tree was planted um, when the first Christian missionaries came to Maui. They planted the tree to commemorate the bringing of the gospel to the island. It was planted in 1873. And as I walked under that tree, I couldn't help but think about the Christian faith. And think about how Jesus called it like a, the kingdom like a small seed that would become a mighty oak. And think about how each of these aerial root systems and these new trunks, these new pillars, were like the generations of faithful men and women who have come before us that have helped carry out and further the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have to ask, are we tending to, to this tree of the kingdom with the same care? Will it endure to the next generation? The Hawaiian people are one who see the land as almost sacred. And so they have babied and preserved this tree and now it endures. Now the next picture I want to show you is of the town of Thurmond. This is Thurmond, West Virginia, which I love to go to this place. But this place is in ruins. We walk back through it, and we get to kind of imagine what life was like. But the town of Thurman was a place that was filled with prostitution and drunkenness and greed. Um, And actually, coincidentally, the town of Thurman was established the same year as that little seed was planted in Maui, 1873. Now, this is a picture of the choice that you and I have in regards to Christianity. If we choose to build without the thought of what will happen to the next generation, the next generation will inherit ruins. But if we cultivate and do the will of God in our generation, we can build like master builders on to what the apostles and the martyrs gave their lives for. 
and what Jesus is coming back for. But to do it, we have to have hearts like mothers and fathers. There are so many spiritual orphans. There are so many spiritual orphans all around us. So when we think about that, what does that mean practically? One of the things that I've, as I process this and internalize this for our family is my children, you know, we first went into lockdown with COVID. We're all virtual. We were doing church at home, and I'm so thankful for the resources from our children's ministry. They worked so hard to provide those. But it came a little bit of time, and I was like, I have got to be back in the house. I want to be back in the house. And so my little four-year-old is chatty, Kathy. And, I mean, like, I was like, I'm not sure how she's going to do, but I'm going to bring her anyway. And so I brought her, and I sat her in the back, and we just started to come. And I watched something at first when I thought she wasn't listening, she wasn't paying attention. I watched as she was doodling, and I thought she was not even really, uh, there, but the next couple of weeks I watched as she would talk about things she heard in the sermon. And one Sunday we sat back there and it was at altar and they were singing a song. No one was saying anything and she starts weeping saying, Jesus died for me. Jesus, he died. Just hearing the worship music. So one of the things that we've been thinking about is this disparity between when Jesus said, suffer not the little children to come to me. Do not stop them. And how really an American mindset is we have done that only through the venue of babysitting. That we take the children and we stick them in another room so that we can concentrate. Now, I'll still do that. My kids are in 11 o'clock children child care right now. But what I've decided personally is that at 9 o'clock, my kids will sit in service. And at 11, they'll go back in children's. Now, I know you don't all have to stay two services. This is just a personal decision I made. I want them to be in this building because what happens is when our children are only shoved away from us in another room getting graham crackers and a Bible lesson and a color sheet, and then they grow up and they're in youth ministry and they get pizza and a scavenger hunt and a Bible lesson, and then they graduate and now they want to come in here and they don't even know us. They have no experience in the house of God. It's not family. It's not nostalgic. They don't know what this is because we've not let them in. We've confined them to let someone else disciple it. It is all of our job to disciple our kids. And we have to let the little children come to our home groups. Let them sit in church. Let them cry a little bit. It's going to be okay. We've all cried at one point in time or another. But this is not a performance. This is an equipping. And our kids have to be a part of this. We have to be family oriented. And so what it's looked like for me is I'm inviting my kids to come at the 9 o'clock. I'll let them be around life groups. But I'm taking it one step further for home groups. I have an organic outflow of who my kids hang around. My teenagers will have life group at my house. And we're going to take the curricula that our, our church is resourcing, and we'll watch it, and we'll eat, and we'll hang out, and we'll pray together. And then I had the idea last week, we're going to go one step further. My son is nine, and I have teenagers. I've been, I'm in the trenches, y'all. You pray for me, right? But I have a nine-year-old that now I have a little back knowledge to know what he's about to go through. And rather than waiting for that, I want to make it normal now for him to talk to his friends about his struggles and to pray with his friends and to study God's word now. So after school on Thursdays, he and four of his best buddies are going to come over and we're going to watch some creationist stuff and we're going to talk. And I said, we're going to break bread. He said, can the bread also have pizza sauce on it? And I said, yes, son. But just making it normal, just making it normal from a young age to be used to, think about if you were eight, nine, four, five, and you've grown up talking to your friends when you're struggling and you're tempted. You've grown up praying for one another. You've grown up breaking bread in your home. It's nor- we've got to make it normal again for the next generation. And as I was praying, I, and I'm very careful when I say this because I think it's overused. I don't want to overuse, like, very careful when I say this. So I, I don't say vision, but I saw in my mind's eye very clearly Pete, some of you in your homes with your, children, with your children's friends, and I felt the Spirit of the Lord say, they don't know it, but from their home, they're sending missionaries that will fulfill the gospel command. That some of you, by opening up your home, such a small thing, feeding kids some pizza and providing a safe place for a child, you will actually fulfill the Great Commission. Having never stepped foot on foreign soil, and you will do it. And God will see it, and that's what God has called you to. But we have to be multi-generational and tend this tree. The the second to last characteristic of a biblical home church is willingly accountable. This means we're submitted to one another and to the global body. 
Now, it says in Acts that they met in the temple daily and in homes, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So basically, they would take these letters, which were sort of like sermons, but now we consider them scripture, and they are scripture, Paul and Timothy's letters. They would take these letters and the Torah, and they would study underground. So they'd create this network of accountability, this, net, this relational network, um, and from that, they were strengthened and matured so that when they didn't have the temple to meet in, they still had an underground network of accountability. But it says in Ephesians, 521, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, this is that interdependency we talked about last week. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. You have blind spots that you can't see. I have blind spots I can't see. When I'm around someone else that loves me in a context of community, you've heard it say home is where the heart is. I'm going to tell you home is where discipleship is. You cannot corporately disciple people. Jesus cast the corporate word, but he had 12 he called to the side. Do you see this? There's a small setting where refining and sharpening happens, where we help one another to apply what we've heard in the corporate word. In James 5, 16, it says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, isn't this interesting that we know God is faithful and just to forgive us if we confess our sins to him? When we confess our sins to God, there's forgiveness. But this is a lost art. When we confess our sins to one another, we're healed. You want to stop asking for forgiveness for the same things and going right back in it over and over and over and invite a brother or sister into your struggle. Confess that, to bring light to that temptation and watch how you are healed. This is the catalyst, the, the, the carbonation, the pop in our discipleship is connection with one another. Ecclesiastes talks about this, and I know we use it a lot of times in the context of marriage, but it says two are better than one. Because if you fall and you don't have someone to pick you up, woe is that man. And listen, how many of us, we have so isolated ourselves, building our own kingdoms and self-consumed with our own families, that when tragedy happens, we don't have anyone. And we have to take ownership in this. Because can I just share from love? just love. Do you please hear me? But we have tried, we have tried to push you to small settings. For years, we have tried. You remember us scratching events? Remember that? Because we said, we realized, oh, it's this, and people did not like that one, one bit. Why did we cancel Sunday night services? Because we wanted to give more opportunity for you to gather in homes. To make more time. We've tried to open life groups and we'll have them for a while. Then people are like, I'm just tired of this. It's too much trouble to open my home all the time. Okay, well, we'll have discipleship in-house. And then people are like, well, it just doesn't feel organic. It feels weird. I don't feel it coming. Do you hear me? Guys, we have to take some ownership of this. And so we're doing what we can to like, okay, well, maybe it was like a blind date. And they're like mixed up with people they don't know and it's awkward. Let's give them some freedom. Let's give them a blessing, you don't need our personal sanction to have one. Just have some people in your home. We're going to resource you. But, guys, we have to take ownership of our own discipleship. Yes. We have to decide, I want to do this. I'm going to make this. I'm going to capture the vision, God's vision because there's going to come a time when you're going to need family around you. You're going to go through some stuff. And this is what these groups did. They met in homes. They met each other's needs. You didn't have to call the, the church every time there was a need because this group just met it. Someone has a baby, they just brought food. They rejoiced everyone. They said there was no needs among them because they shared all things in common. This is the context of true biblical home groups. Now, I'm going to give you a reference um, just as a precaution, as a side note. I do not have time to go through this. Honestly, we could talk about this for six months, but I do not have time to go through this. But if you are considering opening your home in any capacity, and if you want to be a Berean and truly study God's word, I want to challenge you. I'm going to give you some scriptures to go back and read at home. They're also in your app. Um, but there are some things that home groups are susceptible to. They shouldn't make us scared, but we definitely need to be conscious of them according to the New Testament. And we have to be careful not to be hospitable to division, to deception, and to compromise. 
Division, deception, and compromise if we're not submitted to a local body of Christ, and this is where the temple comes back. And this is why if you're doing a home group, we really want you to connect with us so we can help make sure that things don't get weird, that things don't get, um, that heresy doesn't creep in, that division and, and stuff, that sin doesn't come in. We see all of these things happening in New Testament church. It's something they're susceptible to. It shouldn't scare us, but we need to go into it knowing. And so here are some scripture references you can look up. You can take a picture of the screen if you want to wa- read them later later but whole epistles are written the whole first chapter of Jude is written he says I wanted to write about something else but I have to instead write about this because people have wormed their way into your homes that's what it says wormed their way in with deception with compromise and with division so just be careful for that but the last thing that biblical home discipleship is is consciously missional consciously missional means we're not just focused on us and our four now. I told you this is a breath of fresh air, and it is. So what we're asking you to do is to pray about this. And if you decide to open your home, at first just make it very, just people you're super comfortable with. But we have to know that eventually we're going to need to add some people to our group, right? We're going to need to, it says they were adding numbers daily to their group. And so people are added daily to salvation. So we have a place for those who don't have a place to go. We need to be missional. But the most exciting part, and this is what I hope that you get excited about this. The most exciting part about these home groups is this gives you a place to find and to practice your unique God-given gifts. Your God-given gift most likely is not going to function in this room on a Sunday morning. Most likely, it's going to be discovered and developed in the home. And most likely, it's for your sphere at work. In other words, you might have one of the the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. I guarantee you, there's a whole list of spiritual gifts. And chances are, you have a few of them. You just don't know it yet. And in the home setting where it's smaller, you get to discover, hey, man, God shows me things. I have an ability to see through deception. That's called discernment. Or, hey, I felt like God showed me this, gave me this word for something. Hey, I've been praying for you. Are you sick? That's a word of knowledge. You get to discover your gifts and practice them. And it's a safe place. You get to practice praying for people. And why do we do this? As you cultivate that gift, then when you're in your sphere and you're next to your lost work coworker, and God gives it, you've been confident because you've built this up in the home. And now you can confidently share this gift with the lost. This is where your gifts are developed. And in 1 Peter, it says this, the end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sins. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. Now I wanna pause before I go any further. When are we going to just take scripture literal? Like, scripture is not just to give you tweetable content. When Jesus says, bless your enemies, bless those who persecute you. I decided a couple weeks ago, I'm going to stop just saying that and praying for them. I'm going to do something to physically bless someone who is against me. I want to physically act out on this promise. So when Jesus and the apostles say, open your homes, be eager to practice hospitality. Hey, hey church, I'm standing at the door knocking. At what point do we stop just listening and we just do it? I want to be a church that is radical in our literal obedience to the word of God. That if it says take care of the poor, okay, we're taking care of the poor. If it says take care of the orphan, okay, we're taking care of the orphan. If it says open up your home, okay, we're going to open up our home and break bread. That it's not just things that we like to think about, but it's a manuscript for our lives. But then it goes on to say this. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking then be sure to sign up for seminary online. Is this what it says? If you have a gift of speaking, then speak. And so God himself were singing, speaking through you. Some of you, maybe that's the Holy Ghost. If you have a gift of singing, then sing in your home. Sing. You don't need a sanction. You don't need someone to anoint you with oil. You don't need, God has commissioned you already. Use your gift. 
Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy God supplies. Isn't that interesting? There is a spiritual gift of helps. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Christ. And so when we open up our homes, some of the reason that people get weary in opening their home is because honestly, we're not sharing all things in common. We bring the consumer mentality into a home. We show up with nothing in our hands. Our kids destroy their house and then we leave. Come on, I'm getting messy now. But what would happen if we shared all things in common? Now, some of you, you can't open your home. Your home's not big enough. Or you're 35 and you live with your mother, right? Okay, it's okay. We're gonna get you married. Get your holy matrimony. Okay, he's believing. But some of you, you physically can't open your home. But you can help someone who is. Maybe they're bashful and they're embarrassed and they're, they're timid and not outgoing. You could say, hey, if you open your house, then I'll be in charge of all this, the other stuff. And then some would say, well, I can cook something and bring it. And then another would say, well, I'll come beforehand and help you clean and I'll stay after and help you clean, uh, pick up. Do you see what I'm saying? All things in common so it's not a burden on anyone. So that we can support and strengthen the temple to God's original design. But you have gifts that God has given you. Now, you're going to find those mostly in small groups. That is where you identify them and strengthen them. But a cool resource I want to give you as we close is spiritualgiftstest.com. And make sure you put a gifts on the end. Spiritualgiftstest.com. You can go on and you can take a test. They even have a youth version. And this is based on 1 Corinthians 12. And they give biblical descriptions of what each of those gifts mean. And you can actually take this test. Now, I took this test. And so these were, those were my results. Go back for a minute. And just like a side note for some of you, I did notice that as we, um, as we were taking this test with the youth last year, that people that have two or more in the top three in the green category, um, they don't say this on the website. I just noticed a pattern that people with two or more in the green category, you may have a call to ministry. You might be a Levite. And so it's something to recognize and to begin to pray about because those are fivefold ministry gifts. But this is a simple resource that can just get you thinking in that way. You can go home and read 1 Corinthians 12. Just start studying those spiritual gifts. God's uniquely, listen, the world needs your expression of Jesus. It doesn't need six billion melodies. God, help us. It needs your expression of Jesus. It needs your child's expression of Jesus. Teenagers, you can be a mother or father. I know you're going through the thick of this right now, and my heart breaks for this generation. Please hear the mama heart in me. Teens and young adults, I see it. And it was rough when I was your age, but man, there is a different level of darkness that has come upon the earth. And I'm praying for you. But I want you to know, those little ones coming up behind you need you. And you need them. You need to be an example for them. For some of you, teenagers, God wants you to start a small group with little ones to bring them in your home and just play with them. Just get to know them. Listen, this is not complicated. This is organic. This is real. This is Christianity. This is God's design. In the garden, guys, listen, in the garden, he didn't give the garden to Adam fully tilled. It was raw potential. He didn't give the animals fully named. Why? Because God loves partnering with us. He wants you to bring light to your sphere. He wants to use you to further the gospel. God, and we have to get this. Please hear me. We have to get this for the next generation. There are so many spiritual orphans that need us right now. And I was one of those who, it almost killed me. The darkness almost killed me. But a mama took me in and loved me and fed me and prayed for me and I am alive today speaking this message because of one woman who took me in and saw me. Do we see the next generation? Do we see the mandate that's been given to our generation? My biggest prayer leading into this week is please God, let them see they're needed. We cannot, I'm, if I can get on my knees, I could get on my knees and beg you to understand. We need you to carry out the gospel of Jesus. We cannot do this alone. 
He is standing at the door of our church and at the door of our homes knocking. Maybe let him in. Would you bow your heads? God, I just thank you. I just feel the spirit of God in your heart for people and for the lost. God, I pray your church would grab it and hold on. God, let us grab it and hold on. Father, I pray ministry and prophecy and evangelism and miracles would happen in homes. I pray you would call out those who believe they have no purpose and forgive the church for elevating some gifts over the others when everyone is valuable and necessary. And I pray you would empower them as they ponder this that they would pivot, that they would invite you into their homes. In Jesus' name, amen.